and ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the CNBC TV 18 Mint Budget 2017 Budget Verdict. It's a feel-good budget. There's something for everyone. Whether that's meaningful or not is a separate question altogether. Well, uh, we've got our panel of experts lined up to answer questions and field googlies that are going to be thrown from CEOs and our other experts here who join us today at the CNBC TV 18 Mint Budget Verdict. So without further ado, let me call up on stage the Vice Chairman of the Niti Aayog, Dr. Arvind Panagaria. May I also request the CEO of Niti Aayog, Mr. Amitabh Khan, to please join us on stage. And I'd also like to request the chairman of the FRBM panel, Mr. N.K. Singh, to please join us on stage. And to join me in uh, taking our guests through the proceedings of this evening, I'd like to request Anil Padmanabhan of Mint to join us on stage. Anil, thanks very much indeed. My first question, uh, Mr. Panagaria, coming to you. We had a conversation before the budget. You were spot on when you spoke about the fiscal deficit coming in at 3.2%, and that's exactly what the budget number is. But on some of the other suggestions and ideas that you had recommended, your big one was the need for special employment zones or special coastal zones, as you call them. You've been pitching for that idea for a long time. I think one of the criticisms of this budget has been, does the budget address the concerns that we have on the jobs front, where the picture continues to be alarming, jobs growth has been declining? Sir. Let me tell you actually on the jobs front uh, what the budget does. Uh, you really have to read it and put it all together. So uh, about a few months ago there was a, a, a package announced for textiles industry uh, to which the response has been extremely good. Uh, same package has now been extended to the footwear industry. Electronics industry, uh, there have been uh, 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 incentives uh, yeah. in the budget. Uh, then uh, you got the 5% reduction in the uh, 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 small, small and medium, medium firms uh, yeah. with the turnover less than 50, 50 crores. crores. Mudra loans doubled. Yeah. Uh, and uh, labor law reforms have come back on the uh, uh, they, they table. Uh, Amitabh Khan, let me ask you, sir. The big worry and the big concern is on make in India. You know, just ahead of the budget, we did a poll with BMR advisors. I think Gokul Chaudhary is here with us in the uh, audience. And that, surprisingly, and it was a surprise to a lot of us, showed that of the government's flagship schemes, Make in India, and this is a CEO poll, came in at the bottom in terms of effectiveness. It was, I think, the second last on the series of flagship, polls, uh, flagship uh, schemes in terms of its actual effectiveness. Are you concerned, sir, about Make in India, and has the budget really moved the needle at all uh, to be able to achieve the Make in India objective? Actually, the Make in India initiative has led to uh, opening up of the economy in many ways, and uh, India's uh, total receipt of FDI has enormously increased. Uh, it's the number one recipient of foreign direct investments today, beating China. So uh, India's FDI in the last two and a half years have actually grown by 60%, uh, thanks to this Make in India initiative. At a point of time, and globally, FDI is down by 16%. So that's a big plus. I think also uh, Make in India brought ease of doing business right in the forefront, this mm. competition among states. I mean, it's, it's a work in progress, but it, it brought it right in the forefront. It brought in a new intellectual property rights policy. It's done a lot of good in terms of, uh, you know, the pendency on IPR patents, on trademarks, etc. Now, you can't become a manufacturing nation overnight, so it's, much of this work is in progress. But even in this budget, I think there's a lot in fine print okay. I mean, in terms of inverted duty structures. Mr. Panagaria is fighting for special coastal zones. You've been fighting for India to increase and enhance its competitiveness and take more of uh, its share in global trade. Given that we're now living in Trump times and a Trump mm -hmm. era, do you believe that enough has happened on that front to enhance no. competitiveness? No, no, I'm a great believer in globalization. I think uh, globalization has lifted vast segments of population above the poverty line. Post-World War II, Japan, Korea, China have all grown on the back of globalization. So India must aggressively pursue its agenda. It's to the benefit of India to even, uh, even more aggressively. It must be right in the forefront of the globalization agenda. India, it will be very difficult for India to grow at high rates without penetrating global markets. Exports is critical to India's growth. And therefore, my belief is that India must push for exports in a very big way. And that can open, only happen if India pursues uh, trade agreements 
relations with Europe and RCEP and many more. Should so this, my belief this, is that India be, needs to become a far more competitive nation. But I think should, we there, need should there be a sense of urgency now, sir? And I ask you this in the context, for instance, of the India-EU FTA. It's been over a decade now, sir, and there is still no forward movement as far as the India-EU FTA. Just one example specifically. Should there now be a sense of urgency on getting FTAs done that benefit India? Yeah, well, FTAs is not a one-way house. I mean, it requires uh, both people to clap together. So India needs to pursue this vigorously. I think India needs to move forward because you need to uh, ensure that your uh, textile exports, your garments, etc., penetrate uh, the European markets. It's important that your compact cars get into those markets. I think it's better to compromise on, on uh, dairy products, on wine, and ensure that you are able to create many more jobs on textiles to FTAs. I'm a great believer in that. But India also needs to become a far more competitive nation. And I'm glad that in this particular budget, there's a lot of focus on structural changes. Okay. I mean, structural changes across sectors. I, I'll come to some of those structural changes in just a bit. But I think uh, the one big headline that came in from the budget, which got a thumbs up from the market, was the fact that the budget stuck to uh, the path of fiscal consolidation. It deviated just a tad to about 3.2%. Uh, the FRBM panel led by you, uh, Mr. Singh, the recommendations haven't been accepted yet, uh, but we understand that the government will take them on board. You have suggested a fiscal consolidation roadmap of 3%. The finance minister says... He he will do 3% the year after. Uh, there is some concern, though, on the escape clauses as part of your recommendations, which give the government the ability or the leeway to deviate from the fiscal deficit number. Can you share with this audience what the recommendations are uh, and what the concerns could be uh, on this deviation? And take us through when the escape clause can be triggered. Well, Sharin, I think that you have almost presumed that the government have decided to uh, put the report in the public domain. Uh, of course, the finance minister has been generous in devoting uh, uh, a reasonable uh, coverage of the contents of the report. I think that, as you rightly pointed out, that the, as the finance minister has said in his um, budget speech, that we have uh, recommended debt being made as a principal macroeconomic anchor. This is to align India's... Uh, macroeconomic stability policy with the best global practice and we recommended a debt to GDP ratio of 60%, 40% for the central government, 20% for the states to be achieved by uh, 2023 and for that we have calibrated the path of fiscal deficit along with the revenue deficit which will enable this optimal debt GDP ratio to be reached which of course has many multiplier effects. I mean it would be viewed very positively by the investors the fact that the fiscal consolidation has continued has got a thumbs up from the market, as also the fact that the finance minister has indicated his intention to return to 3% fiscal deficit next year and to continue on that trajectory uh, for several years to come. So this has really enthused investors. It will lend confidence and predictability to our fiscal strategy. And this is likely to be rewarded in multiple ways, which has already begun in, in a significant way by the markets uh, really beginning to look up. Now, you asked a very specific question on the escape clauses. Now, you know, um, Shireen, the second generation fiscal reforms globally, all over the world, have escape clauses. Escape clauses are put there that there are some conditions under which governments are obliged to deviate from the accepted path of uh, fiscal consolidation or the accepted fiscal roadmap. And we have stipulated these conditions. We have made it uh, firewall as much as possible. We have stipulated, for instance, uh, one of the conditions, in fact, the finance minister read out in his uh, speech yesterday, far-reaching structural reforms mm -hmm. which have unintended revenue consequence to be one of the factors on which, of course, there are others like, for instance, acts of war, uh, collapse of agriculture, uh, collapse of GDP, and so on. Um, these are not, uh, these are uh, very, very unusual Just events which do not I, occur I, on a I'm daily so basis. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you were talking about structural reforms that could have unintended consequences on, on uh, revenue, sir. Would the GST perhaps qualify as, as such a structural reform? Well, I think this interpretation of whether it does or it does not, in our report, is contingent on 
the recommendations of an institutional mechanism which we have proposed in the report, which is a fiscal council. Mm -hmm. In line with the best international practice, fiscal council and the constitution of a fiscal council has been something which has been recommended by the it was recommended by the first FRBM in 2003. Okay. It was recommended by the 12th Finance Commission. It was recommended by the 13th Finance Commission. And the 14th. By the 14th Finance yeah. Commission, which yeah. you know. But we have said that the invocation of the scape clause and whether or not the conditions are ripe for that kind of an invocation to take place should ordinarily happen based on the recommendations of the Fiscal Council. Okay. I think the Finance Minister has been quite honest that since the okay. Fiscal Council has not been Set constituted up, yes. as yet, he has not invoked escape clauses and just taken a very marginal deviation. One of the key takeaways in this budget was the uh, annulment of the plan, non-plan uh, idea and the moving to a revenue and capital expenditure. The implicit idea was to move to an outcome-oriented uh, uh, decision-making on rather funding system. Uh, so the, but the finance minister in his speech uh, snuck it there saying that the Niti Aayog will do the monitoring part of this. So what is the mechanism that you'll have in place and what will be the kind of transparency that uh, say will you, do, will you be doing quarterly outputs, uh, status updates? Uh, could you just elaborate? One of the key things is uh, in this budget that there's a very integral component of the budget is this outcome budget. Yeah. Which We've prepared across ministries, and this is for the first time that we've done this. Uh, Niti has done this, a lot of hard work with the ministries, all the ministries. So there's clear defined outcomes for every single ministry. Uh, they all, and this will bring in good governance, this will bring in accountability. All this has been put on dashboard. Uh, it will be regularly monitored on a monthly basis. So everybody So who are the outperformers, sir? Uh, well, uh, you know, we've been doing this uh, for quite some sectors for the Prime Minister, actually. And the road sector has been doing, uh, so far, road sector has done quite well. Okay. So the road sector continues to be the outperformer. Yes, Mr. Singh. Uh, you know, Anil, I want to respond. Uh, this plan, non-plan, of course, uh, you mentioned, and um, Amitav has brought out this issue of the outcome budget. But the other point which you mentioned about revenue and capital expenditure, I think that's an enormous mess. Uh, frankly, uh, the FRBM panel had debated the issue of abolishing uh, this distinction between revenue and capital, just as the plan and non-plan have now been merged into a single component. Okay. We couldn't do it because in the Constitution, revenue and capital have been mentioned, but certainly the ingredients of what goes into revenue expenditure mm -hmm. and what goes into capital expenditure, that we have recommended should be reworked out and rethought because the expenditure, for instance, on, uh, on education and on health, which is transferred to the states, is counted as revenue expenditure, and I think that that deserves really a reconsideration. Let me come to you first, Nana. Uh, questions, comments for Mr. Kant, Mr. Panagaria, and Mr. Singh? Well, uh, I didn't actually have a question on banks, so let me ask the question I have, which is, on the, the very aggressive privatization agenda, which is very, very exciting. And uh, this really to you, Dr. Panagriya, that if you could share with us the Niti Aayog's uh, vision of the new India vis-a-vis -vis this preponderance of public sector engagement that uh, the country has. I had a second question really for Amitabh, and uh, it's really more to do with what is being widely lauded as the removal of FIPB, uh, which uh, I, I, I would share, given that it's in the mode of 100% automatic FDI, but as we don't have 100% automatic FDI, what happens to that 5% that looks to an FIPB for the interministerial running from pillar to post, which was somehow sought to be sorted through? And where do they go when they look for approval? So, uh, Okay. So um, on, on the privatization, let me very quickly say that uh, we did pull together uh, 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 very quickly, but, but very, after very detailed discussions, a list of 70, about 17 enterprises uh, for privatization, uh, which uh, has been approved by the uh, cabinet. Uh, the ball is now in the court of the finance ministry, the DIPAM. Department of Investment and uh, Public Asset Management, 
uh, they uh, the process there is underway. So you, you would see. I told uh, this to Shireen and uh, one of the earlier interviews that uh, uh, I'm expecting the first sale to happen in the very first quarter of 1718. Mr. Khan, you wanted to respond to the question on FIPB. 93.8 percent, to be precise. Uh, you know, the total FDI that comes into the country comes in through the automatic route. So FIPB really outlived its uh, utility and uh, its abolition really demonstrates the government's uh, commitment to removing any kind of red tape and push for much quicker, much faster investment. So 5 or 6 percent should actually be seen through uh, by, you know, individual ministries and wherever there is any blockade of any kind, DIPP as the nodal ministry should coordinate and see that. Uh, actually, logically, all this remaining 6% should all be put through the automatic route itself. Allow everything to come through the automatic route, okay. except for defense. Mr. Kant, let me start by asking you, sir, what will the headline be for 2017? You know, my personal belief is that we need to bring in a greater total factor productivity increase, and you need to push for disinvestment in a much bigger way. Okay. You know, you need to push for disinvestments uh, in a much bigger way. You also need to uh, capitalize your banks. You need to also push for private sector investments. These three things are critical for India to grow rapidly. Okay, and we hope that we achieve some of that. Mr. Singh? Well, I certainly like to see a quantum change in the, uh, in the way in which the strategy for the agriculture sector is being implemented, along with, I think, I'd uh, add to the fact that entire area of banking reforms and restoring the health of the financial system would be a, a very high priority in my view. Mr. Panagaria? I would still like to see the coastal employment zones launched. <laughs> You're not giving up. The coastal uh, employment zones continue to be the number one idea. Arvind Panagaria, N.K. Singh, Amitabh Khan, thank you very much for joining us here on the CNBC TV 18 Budget Verdict. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause, please. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the CNBC TV 18 budget verdict. Please join me in welcoming the team from North Block here on stage. Uh, may I request the Finance Secretary, Mr. Ashok Lavasa, to please come up on stage, sir. I also request the Economic Affairs Secretary, Mr. Shakti Kanta Das, to please join us on stage. Also joining us on stage, the Revenue Secretary, Mr. Hasmuk Adia. Sir, can we please have you join us on stage? The man who is going to have to show the money the DPAM Secretary, Mr. Neeraj Gupta. Mr. Gupta, please join us on stage. May I also request Anil to please join us on stage to take the proceedings forward. <laughs> Mr. Das, let me start by asking you, sir. Uh, these are the comments that have come in now from former Finance Minister P. Chidamrams about the budget, sir. He says, gross fixed capital formation has fallen precipitously. The budget does not do anything to address that. There is nothing in the budget to revive private investment. There is nothing in the budget to revive lagging growth, sir. Mr. Das, how would you respond to Mr. Chidambaram? It's not proper for me to sort of uh, respond to what a former finance minister has said, but uh, on a more serious note, if the, the problems of the economy are known today, the fact that gross capital formation is low is something which, uh, you know, which even the economic survey has uh, accepted and which even the finance minister himself has also made a note of it. And uh, there are several factors for it. It's nothing to do with the domestic policies. It's the overall, when you're globally, you know, how much of investment is taking place globally today? Mm. You have to see how much of investment is taking place in the emerging markets, how much investment is taking place in the developed world. Within that, if you see, I think earlier session, I heard that there was a mention about the FDI inflows. Yes. And the finance minister has given the numbers in the budget. Yes. I don't have to repeat that. Now, the FDI inflows in the first half of this month compared to the first half of last year have grown by 35%, when world over the FDI inflows have gone down by 5%. Right. A lot of investment is taking place. For the SME sector, not exactly SME, but for the companies which are 50, having a turnover of 50, 50 crores or less, and which represent 96% of the companies, the, uh, the finance minister has reduced the tax rate from 30% to 25%. So that much 
of additional resources and funds are left with these companies which are the largest employment provider in the industry and in the other sectors. They are the largest uh, employment providers. So that much of additional resources are left with these companies mm. to invest. Now, I mean, I can go on and on and list measures which have been sure. taken by the government. Look at the gross numbers. The gross numbers, I mean, various people have made various estimates about the so-called impact of the demonetization. Yeah. So far, all the assessments about the impact of demonetization are based on impressions, based on some kind of uh, presumptions, anecdotal evidence. Anecdotal yes. evidence. Yeah. Let the numbers come. There is some impact. Nobody is denying that there is no impact. But having said that, let us also recognize that the impact, the so-called impact of the demonetization is not expected to spill over to next That's year. That's what the finance fact, minister said. But it's a fact recognized by all the rating agencies sure. and the evidence of that, the signs of that are clearly visible. You have today huge amount of low cost deposits available with the banks yeah. which will enable the banks to in fact they have started the process of reducing the interest rates it will enable the banks to lend at lower rates yeah. and not only lower rates to the industries to the small and medium and yeah. the large industries but also take it it's very important individual loans i know i'll just give me half a minute go ahead now it is it is you know the it will enable the banks to lend individual housing loans to large number of people yeah. Consumption loans, scooter or motorcycle loans, car loans. So that's going to, you know, that's going to bring about a huge impact, positive impact on the consumption cycle in the economy. Mr. Adia, let me come to you, sir. Since Mr. Das had talked about the benefits and the demonetization gains, sir, the budget actually hasn't factored in any demonetization gains at this point in time. For instance, you haven't factored in what could come by way of the Pradhan Mantri uh, Garib Kalyan uh, Yojana. Uh, the budget perhaps has not even factored in that there could be a revision as far as the uh, RBI dividend is concerned, which has currently been factored in at about 50 Eight or thousand crores. So, can you give us a sense, Mr. Adia, of what kind of gains we can uh, estimate as far as demonetization benefits are concerned? Well, uh, in the revenue department, uh, we always have to be very, very conservative. The scheme of Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan Yodhna is going to close on 31st of March. We don't know how much money we are going to get in that. And so, for the purpose of uh, uh, you know, maintaining the tradition of conservatism, we are not taking any figure in the current year's revised estimate as far as that scheme is concerned. Whatever comes will be available to us for the use in uh, different schemes of the government, but we are not accounted for it in the RE. Mm. As far as next year's growth is concerned, we have predicted a very good, solid growth rate of 15.3% as far as direct taxes uh, is concerned. Now this also I am very sure that we would be surpassing this growth rate because we are seeing a lot of uh, early signs of improvement in compliance of personal income tax. Mm. The one figure which FM had quoted was that in the first three quarters of this year the increase in the advanced tax in personal income tax yeah. is to the extent of 34%. We hope the same trend will continue in the next year. Okay. Uh, I'll come to GST in, in just a second and talk to you about that. But I, I, I want to just get one quick comment from you, Mr. Adia. You know, the former governor, uh, Mr. Subarao, said uh, to us that at least on the back of demonetization, there should be a 1% increase in the tax to GDP ratio. Do you believe that that will be achieved? Well, it will come. What has happened is that the increase in tax to GDP ratio is not very starking because of the fact that we got some bonanza in form of oil revenues, mm. the taxes on oil, petroleum products, in the current year as well as in the last year. Now, on top of that, the increase in the tax to GDP ratio doesn't seem to be very impressive. Okay. But we do hope, as I told you again, that even the 15% growth rate that we are estimating in direct taxes, that will also be far surpassed and we will have a much better text to GDP ratio next year. Much better would mean what, sir? Much better than what is estimated. <laughs> okay, much better than what is estimated. Mr. Lavasa, let me ask you, sir. Uh, you know, the fiscal deviation, the fiscal deficit deviation to the tune of about 3.2%, I 
guess that frees up what about between 32 or 35 odd thousand crore rupees uh, for you, sir. Uh, in terms of expenditure, there is a decline year on year. Uh, capital expenditure, though, of course, is uh, budgeted about 24% higher. Give us a sense of the allocations that have been made by the budget and whether that really will be enough, sir, as far as uh, the development agenda is concerned. The issue that you raise about expenditure, first of all, uh, I don't know why you say that there is a reduction in expenditure. In fact, uh, the expenditure which is proposed this year is 21,47,000 crore, which is all-time high. And only the other day we were talking to somebody who said that he recalls in the not too distant past that this used to be half of this number. Hmm. So I think uh, the spending which government has planned is very high. The other point to be noted is uh, the quality of expenditure which the government proposes to incur. And I think very carefully, uh, three or four areas have been identified for increased allocation. One area is how do we consolidate the rural economy? How do we strengthen uh, our rural development programs? Mm -hmm. How do you further lift the agriculture and allied sectors, which this year agriculture sector is uh, projected to grow at 4%. Yes. And it can be nobody's case that not more investment is required in the agriculture sector. Sure. So agriculture and allied sectors, dairying, uh, the white revolution, blue revolution, these are some of the areas that have received government's attention. The second area, of course, is uh, the other rural development, infrastructure-related programs, which have a lot to do with creating employment and also improving the quality of life in the rural areas. Mm. The third is the infrastructure sector. And the fourth is that there are a number of uh, schemes in which government is investing, which will have uh, cross-cutting implications, which are the schemes which are uh, of creation of skills, uh, for the youth particularly. So I think these are the four broad areas in which allocations have been made. The fact that the fiscal deficit is maintained at 3.2 percent yeah. uh, instead of 3 which was earlier forecast right. gives us an additional space. But more than that additional space, I think a lot of space comes from uh, reallocating the expenditure okay. uh, and prioritizing some of the schemes which will generate employment and which will lead to infrastructure growth. Uh, the man who's uh, got a stiff target to achieve is the Deepam Secretary, Mr. Neeraj Gupta, says over 72,000 crore rupees is what has been budgeted by way of disinvestments, which also includes strategic divestments. Amitabh Kant has set a challenge for you, sir, saying that the priority for the government in 2017 should be strategic disinvestment, private Realistically, when do you set the ball rolling? When you talk of, about a stiff target, so last year the focus was changed. This time it has been more focused in terms of activities. Mm. Just to mention four activities. Insurance sector will be divesting. It has been clearly reflected in the budget. Yeah. Listing of the companies will be big size, mid size, profit making CPSEs will become absolutely time-bound. It has a focus in the budget. Mergers and acquisitions, yes. which were not taking place, in 2016, nearly 6 lakh crores of mergers and acquisitions took place in India in the private space. Uh, two mergers which are in the recent memories, Hindustan Steel Construction, yeah. and uh, uh, mergers of SBI, yeah. as the biggest step. But this coming in focus now, mm to improve the value chain, integrate the value chain, create economies of scale, and bring such companies which can really compete in the world. Yeah. And fourth, the investment is not a traditional divestment. We had been doing OFSs, yeah. three, four OFSs in a year, garnering 20, 21,000 crores. We have done 11 transactions this year, garnering nearly 31,000 crores. Hmm. And the year is not yet ended. What I'm trying to say is, ETF has been announced. Yeah. And the success of ETF, 2,70,000 retail investors participating in it, in an issue of 6,000 crore. Yeah. And cornering nearly 41% of the issue. Mm. This shows there is an appetite in the retail segment and which we want to deepen now. And you're launching your third. And let me say very frankly, in 11 transactions which we have done, 
there are hardly any bailouts. Mm. So there had been better participation of DIs, FIIs, retail in most of the segments. So we really want to diverse professionally. So these four points I wanted to say should be seen in the backdrop of the target. Okay. There is a lot of activity space left for us. And please bear with us. We will be performing. Targets have to be challenging. But we have to live with them and we have to meet them. I want to take forward the point that Mr. Gupta made there, sir, uh, on this business of uh, m and which has been talked about and strategic divestment, which the government uh, has talked about, sir. I'll put uh, on board just one example, uh, IDBI Bank. Uh, you know, we've been talking about it. It was a budget proposal last year, sir. We've still not seen IDBI Bank go through. What seems to be the trouble? And then when we look at examples like this, it raises questions on the ability to get strategic disinvestment or any meaningful kind of consolidation done, sir. Now, IDBI, you see, it, the announcement was made. It is work in progress. Yes, I agree, it has taken time. But IDBI has a, you know, you have to recognize certain, uh, uh, um, uh, certain features of the IDBI. IDBI, the share value in the market does not reflect the huge amount of real estate which IDBI Bank holds in Mumbai and in other places. Okay. So you need to first value, you know, have a kind of a valuation about that real estate. Okay. Then you have to take a call. How are you going to deal with that real estate valuation as a part of any divestment you are doing? Okay. So therefore, whether you go for, uh, you know, a divestment of 5% or 10% and yeah. then take it down gradually or do a bigger dose. So there were issues which had to be considered very carefully. Is it done now, and, sir? Uh, any decision has to be a very, very carefully considered, transparent decision, which stands every, uh, you know, every possible Scrutiny. norms of due diligence. Yeah. So that exercise is underway, and I am sure uh, you will see more action on that front in the coming month. What is the status on the possibility of changing the financial year, sir? Well, the report is under consideration of the government and uh, as and when a decision is taken, you will know about it. So I think now uh, people in this room are waiting to hear. Uh, I, the next meeting of the GST Council is on the 18th of this month, sir. Uh, when are we going to finally get some sense of what the rates will be? What is the status, sir? Well, uh, what the industry is looking forward to hear about is the law and the rules. Because it is the law and the rules, once they are finalized completely by the GST Council, they could make their individual softwares or, you know, ERPs yes. for implementing GST. Especially if they have to be... roll out on the 1st of July. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So that's something which everybody is looking forward to. In the next meeting, that's the agenda. We would like to take up all the laws and uh, not the rules this time. This time it will be all the three laws which will be looked at, the final draft of the law. In the subsequent meeting, we'll take up rules also. As far as the rates are concerned, I think it is possible for anybody to now make a calculation mm. and decide for themselves what the rate is going to be for them. Because it's going to be a simplistic formula. The GST council has said that they will have four slabs of rate, 5%, 12%, 18%, and 28%. Yeah. And the formula is that whatever is the existing incidence of tax of excise plus VAT or service tax plus VAT, you calculate that, what is the present incidence that your particular industry has mm -hmm. of tax. And that nearest to that, whatever slab is fitting into, that will be the slab for you. So 3% here, 3% there. Only thing is there would be few items where there would be a need to change their bracket completely. Mm. It may be closer to 28%, but still we need to put it in 18%. The fitment formula is already given. The fitment formula is already given. Mm. Uh, the, the, the head of the empowered panel on the GST, Dr. Amit Mitra, uh, yesterday speaking to me, said that he sent the finance ministry 16 uh, requests that he has or 16 demands that he has for the GST council to look into. One, of course, is the issue of the arrest clause uh, as part of the legislation, which has been diluted somewhat, but he believes that that's draconian, should be done away with altogether, sir. Uh, how would you respond to some well, of those demands? That clause about, uh, you know, uh, power to arrest for tax default is provided for in the excise and service tax law now. It is also there in the wet laws of couple of states also. For example, Gujarat law has got it. Bihar also said they have got this provision. The question is ki, it is not a routine provision put there. 
after a lot of consideration, we are saying that anybody who has escaped tax of 2 crore and above, he only will be an ideal candidate. And that also, up to 5 crore, even if he is arrested, it will be bailable offence. Mm -hmm. So immediately, as soon as he is found the arrest warrant, he will be given a bail by the officer himself, okay. whoever is arresting. Let me ask each of you to, uh, to end by giving us a headline. And Mr. Das, I'm going to start by asking you, sir, uh, 2017, what would you believe will be the number one priority that you, know, you would like to see the government take forward and actually achieve? That this budget is very strong on fiscal, very strong on the macroeconomic parameters, and very strong on reforms. So if you, it now just a question of continuing with the same uh, priorities and continuing with the implementation. Okay, Mr. Lavasa. I think all of us should look forward to is A, both government and people sitting here should spend more money, and I think we should have a more tax compliant society. We should have a more tax compliant society. That would make you very happy, Mr. Adia. What will be your headline for 2017? For the Department of Revenue, 2017 will be the year of GST. We would like it to be implemented. The DPAM Secretary, Mr. Gupta, your headline for 2017? We we'll look for a very stable and buoyant market. So that <laughs> we can well, here, here to that. Gentlemen, always a pleasure. Thank you very, very much on behalf of Mint and CNBC TV 18 for joining us here for the budget verdict. A big round of applause to the team from Loft Block. Welcome back. As we continue to discuss the fine print of Budget 2017 on the Mint CNBC TV 18 budget verdict. Joining us now here uh, with us is the Minister for Coal Power, uh, Mr. Piyush Goyal. Sir, thank you very, very much uh, from, for joining us here uh, for the budget verdict. Uh, I think the biggest positive that people have taken away from the budget is that the government has stuck to the path of fiscal consolidation. There has been no profligacy in an obvious sense. Uh, what should we now realistically expect? in terms of the reform agenda for the road ahead? A lot of things have been said about the reform agenda, particularly when it comes to having more clarity in the way foreign investments will be treated, particularly when it comes to the tax roadmap for taxation in the country, and in terms of the government's long-term priorities to have a strong fiscal situation, taking care of the macroeconomy on the one hand, while at the same time encouraging investments, encouraging people to spend more with uh, more money in their pockets, helping the farmers towards doubling their income, get easier availability of cheap credit, get availability of all other mm. uh, mechanisms, whether it's soil card, whether it's uh, irrigation facility, whether it's their ability to ensure their output, various steps to encourage and empower the farmers on the one hand, various steps to encourage entrepreneurship on the other hand and amongst all of that the overarching aim by 2022 to have shelter on everybody's head mm. to have electricity, toilets good quality education and healthcare universally across the country all of these put together is what will drive demand and demand will obviously uh, drive investment. Sir, Twitter questions are coming in thick and fast, Mr. Goyal, and this one has to do more specifically with your ministry, sir. So let me put that question to you. Uh, Mr. Goyal, why is the PLF of thermal plants still so low? This nation had a lot of projects which were stressed, stalled, stranded, and were not able to be completed for either lack of environmental approval, some land problem, promoter problems, banking problems, finance problems. And this was a phenomenon across the power sector. After this government came in, we realized that no new investment will come in the sector unless these old investments which are clogging the system in a way are resolved. Mm. And I'm delighted to share with you that in the first two years itself, we were able to get 45,000 megawatts of power plants back into operation, which were all otherwise just stalled at different levels. Now, on a, on a requirement where the country today at an average day takes up about 136 gigawatt, 136,000 megawatt of capacity is consumed in any normal working day, you add 45 gigawatt within two years. So, in a way, your, your denominator has increased so significantly in terms of the available capacity that obviously demand can't grow by 
you know, 30% or 35% in one year or two years. So obviously that PLF supposedly falls, but if you were to reflect that from the old plants and the new plants separately, you'll find that the PLF of all the operating old plants has gone up significantly. Mm. Many of these new projects were set up without even a PPA in hand. And therefore, they are facing stresses. But I'm happy that at least they've got commission. Now the nation knows that they can get even 50% more power if the demand increases at, at uh, and a drop, uh, drop of a hat, literally. So the nation today is power surplus, it's coal surplus. Do you now get a sense, sir, that private investment is on the cusp or on the verge of picking up? There has been demand contraction, which got exacerbated post-demonetization. It's not just a phenomena of demonetization. We have a problem of broken balance sheets within the private sector. That is a problem that is yet to be addressed fully. The NPA problem is what holds banks back, perhaps, from lending. So do you get a sense today that we're in a better position to try and see a pickup as far as private investment is concerned, and whether the budget, in any form or fashion, has turned the needle on that? Well, uh, if you look at the situation in the country in 2014 and you look at the situation today you'll realize the big change that has happened in 2014 our job was to repair a broken economy and while repairing that broken economy we also took the opportunity to create a sustainable framework for long-term sustainable development of the economy at that stage we had two parts before us we could have easily just asked the banks to do a in Hindi, said, they say lipatopi or just a cover-up operation and keep restructuring loans, keep allowing the situation to deteriorate and have a business-as-usual scenario. But in the long run, the bubble had to burst someday. We decided to take the bull by the horns. We asked the banks to clean up their balance sheets, take the hit wherever projects were beyond repair, accept liability wherever there was bad lending, support cases where there was a possibility of revival and resurrection. And I'm happy to note that all the banks have really benefited from this cleaning up operations. It may look like a stress today, but that stress is better taken today than taken three years later when further interest has piled up and the balance sheets get even more stressed. Okay. Mr. Akhil Gupta here has a question for you, sir. I think time and again it has been shown that we are now power surplus. But the problem is that in villages in particular, we do not have the last mile connectivity. And I think that in terms of the basic infrastructure, telecom, as you know, is an important part. You have been a big supporter of telecom. If we have to really move forward towards a digital India, which means simply taking internet to every citizen, we would need that power, sir. So if you could please... Absolutely good point. Get uh, very well taken, Mr. Gupta. Uh, very clearly, the power is not a problem. We have sufficient power and as much and more. Problem is certainly the last mile, which is a state subject, and I am not able from here to directly distribute to all these 300 or 400,000 towers. Otherwise, I would love to because I want to sell more power. I also try to see if power grid could become a distribution licensee and take a connection, but then those uh, high-tension lines don't have the technical ability to be able to serve these towers. I would have to actually lay new lines. And then it would be in uh, contrast with the state government's own priorities and get me into a mess. You know what's happening to my company in West Bengal. They've set up a, a power substation. It's already completely set up, up and about, should have been in commission in January. But then the ghosts have come home to roost now. And... Uh, History is repeating itself on its head to the current government there. And in the process, it, it portends very dangerous signals if we are not able to take power to, the, to every nook and corner of the country. But that's an unfortunate single incident in West Bengal. Largely across the country, states are now more and more getting committed to ensuring power for all 24 by 7. Uh, what I'll do is I'll talk to the states and see if we can get them to have an uh, incentive come penalty structure and give you 24 by 7 power, because in any case you are using diesel, which is much more expensive. Mr. Razan, go ahead, sir. You set a very aggressive target of 175 gigawatts for new renewables, essentially solar and wind. Now, this intermittent power requires a very strong component of balancing power and storage and smart grids. 
So in this budget, what are we looking at for the hydro sector, you see? The gestation period of the kind of projects we have now on our shelf is about 10 years. And there are some hydro projects which I had initiated as a joint secretary. They're still not operational. The other thing is that for the hydro sector was looking forward to renewable energy status in this budget. And I do not think it has happened. The other is storage, sir. If you do not have balancing power, you should have storage. Now, I have to find an allocation for developing indigenous storage manufacturing capacity in the country, that's batteries. And the last is smart grids and distribution. We cannot have so much renewable power in the system without smart grids and distribution. And these projects are going to come up within six months to one year. Whereas the gestation period for all the other things that I've talked about may be anywhere between two to ten years. Thank you, Mr. Razdan. I am almost wondering whether you still have somebody in my office checking out <laughs> what my program is. Because this afternoon at exactly four o'clock, I had my lunch and soon after that I sat on the hydro with both the power secretary and the renewable energy secretary. And we had a detailed discussion as regards moving it to renewable, it doesn't need the budget or uh, decision at the budget level. I'll be taking it up to cabinet. We are still studying all the comparable examples in different, from different parts of the world. There is some concern about the methane or, or some part of the gas, gases that come out of hydropower, which has been flagged off by some NGOs and environmentalists. I normally like to get everybody on board before I take such a major decision. But I myself am convinced that looking at whatever I've seen, most parts of the world have recognized it as uh, renewable. And uh, once I get my final report, I'll be taking it to the cabinet. As regards the storage systems, the battery storage is still quite expensive. For a country like India, it's not going to work out. Maybe telecom could afford it. But a common citizen or at the village level, it's not going to work out. And if we have to give 24 by 7 power, we are still dependent on coal as a base load and solar and wind and hydro is supplementing that. Having said that, as I increase 275 gigawatts of uh, solar, wind and other forms of renewable energy, I do understand the balancing of the grid is going to be a critical factor. We are working on trying to get the hydro sector revitalized. We are seeing how to make hydro costs down to under 5 rupees. A little bit of financial engineering, and a little bit of uh, working through the system by uh, supporting and encouraging it uh, by budgetary support. So then let me end, sir, by asking you, I've been asking everybody to give us a headline for 2017. What is Piyush Goyal's headline going to be for 2017? India is open for business. The ball is in your court. Are you willing to take the first mover advantage? Let's go for it. India is probably the world's largest market today aspiring for a better quality of life, you can't get a better opportunity to get into meeting the aspirations of the people of India. My view is, you all have to take a call, industry, business, investors have to take a call before somebody else does. Indian entrepreneurship has the ability, sometimes doesn't move fast enough. So I do hope Indian entrepreneurs move quickly to catch the opportunity that India offers today. Taking you up on your challenge, sir, Mr. Goyal, it's always a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you very much for joining us on the CNBC TV 18 Mint Budget Verdict 2017. A big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen.